And like Jake said, I'm an actor. Um, I'm also a writer and a director. A uh, short subject documentary filmmaker. I'm a father and a husband. Um, I'm a chef. I love to cook. Um, as I'm getting older, I'm doing a little life coaching. You know, talking to people about um, about living. You know. Uh, Worry free. We're in care. We're you know living carefree, um, which means that um, I have to trust. You know I have to trust the process, uh, the journey. Um, this is not a sprint. It's a marathon. Um, but most importantly, um, in labeling you know, who I am and, and what I do, um, I consider myself a poet. Uh, acting is an art form, and <clears throat> I know there's a lot of commerce in art. You know, people sell their paintings, movies are made and their tickets are sold, um, books are written, and people pay money to read them. <clears throat> But what we're doing is an art form. And the poet, there is the least amount of commerce in being a poet. So it's the truest art form. And a great example of, well, how do you know you're a poet? How do you know you're an artist? You know, How do I know that this is what I'm supposed to do for the rest of my life? Yeah. Uh, Michael Campbell talks about following your bliss uh, or what you were meant to do. Uh, Michael Jordan was meant to play basketball, right? I mean, you can't dispute that, you know? Uh, he tried to play baseball, and we saw what happened with that, right? So he's meant to be. He's found his bliss, his calling, what he was born to be. Um, I didn't know I wanted to be an actor until I was 21. I grew up in Newark, New Jersey, on the corner of Ridge Street and Bloomfield Avenue with Johnny Dimps, Tommy Motorola, and the Weasel. We dealt drugs, we went to the racetrack, we shot pool, we played cards, we gambled. And um, when I took my SATs, um, they gave me something called an aptitude test. And the aptitude test was 100 random questions, no right or wrong answers, just likes and dislikes. And the results come out in three professions. And the three professions were mathematician, architect, and actor. So I go in to see my guidance counselor, and I only got accepted to one of the three schools that I applied to, so we already knew where I was going to college. But now I had to decide on what I was going to study what my major was going to be. So he says, um, well, you know, Northeastern has a really good engineering program, and you're really good in math, and your aptitude test, you know, came out mathematician. He goes, uh, you want to be an engineer? And I'm like, no. <laughs> he said, okay. He says, well, um, let's just talk a little bit more about that. You know, they have electrical engineering. The, what do you know about electricity? I said, you see that light switch? He goes on and it goes off. He says, okay, I guess we're not going to run down that one for you. No, that's not good. Um, he ran, what did chemistry? I said, I'm barely passing chemistry. He goes, okay, forget about chemical engineering. He says, um, they have this thing called biomedical engineering. It's fairly new. Um, I said, well, what's that all about? He goes, well, it's, um, um, it has to do with helping people, and you work in the hospitals, and I say bio, you know, medical, I'm thinking bionic. I said, is that like the bi bionic man was on TV, you know, $6 million man was on TV. I said, you mean you get to make artificial limbs and, you know, shit like that? He's like, yeah, that's part of it, but you also get to create life support systems um, to help people stay alive. I said, oh, that sounds really cool, man. I'll, um, I'll check that out. So I went to Northeastern University to be a biomedical engineer. I was 18 years old. And after my freshman year, I uh, attained 28 out of a possible 48 credits. I had a 1.6 grade point average. 
Um, I was uh, on academic probation, and I was on the dean's list. Well, the dean has two lists. <laughs> the list you want to be on and the list you don't want to be on. And I was on the dean's shit list, and I either had to get a 3.0 or better my next semester, or I was kicked out of college. So I just took some basic courses. But during this period of discovery, during this time, you know, college was great because it's a liberal arts college for me was great because it was an opportunity for me to explore, an opportunity for me to try things, an opportunity for me to find my bliss or what I was meant to do, you know, like Michael Jordan was meant to do or Tiger Woods was meant to do. Um, so I would call my mom complaining, I hate it here, I want to come home, I don't want to do this anymore. She says, look, you're really good in math. She goes, why don't you try accounting? Uh, so I tried accounting, I got A's, but I hated it. And I said, call them now. I'm done, man. I'm, I don't know what we're doing here. We're wasting our time, we're wasting our money. Come on, I can come home, I can get a job at an entry level at somewhere and work my way up. She goes, no, no, she goes, stay in college, please stay in college, just get a degree. She goes, let's try economics. I tried economics, I got all A's in economics, but I hated it. So now I'm done. I'm halfway through my second year. I'm finding this whole experience to be fruitless. And she says, um, remember that aptitude test you took? I said, yeah. She goes, what were the three professions? I said, architect I said, mathematician, architect, and actor. She goes, why don't you take an acting class? <laughs> I said, I laugh. I said, mom, I said, you know what I know about acting? I go to the movies and there they are. That's how much I know about acting. She goes, look, no matter what you do in life, you're going to have to get up in front of people. You're going to have to give presentations. I'm in insurance for 34 years. And before our salesmen go out into the field, we have them take an acting class to get comfortable with the one-on-one -on -one experience. It can only help you. So to appease my mother, that semester I took accounting two, statistics two, acting one, and another theater class called stage and body movement. And halfway through that semester, I withdrew from statistics and accounting, and I knew what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. I didn't care if I was going to make a dime at it. Which brings me back to the poet. Because the poet, the odds of a poet making a penny for his poem or her poem are very slim. But the poet gets hungry. And the poet wants to eat. So the poet gets a job at Ralph's, because that's where the food is. Right? And he gets a job bagging groceries. And there's the poet bagging these groceries. And he's not where he's supposed to be because it's not his bliss. And it's killing him to bag these groceries. And this can of corn comes down the conveyor belt, this bag of sugar. And he gets an inspiration. And he runs and he gets a pen and he grabs one of those paper bags and he starts writing his poem. And the manager says, what are you doing? And he goes, well, I'm writing a poem. And he goes, yeah, but you're supposed to be bagging groceries. He says, yeah, I will in a minute, but I, I, got, I, got, I got to finish writing this poem. And he says, you either bag those groceries or you get the hell out of here. And the poet has to make a decision. And he takes that paper bag and he takes that pencil and he walks out of Ralph's grocery store because he's got no other choice but to write that poem. So if that is who you are, congratulations. If that is who you are not, it's going to be a really long, hard haul. It's going to be a really long, hard haul. Because if you don't have to do this, then why are you doing it? If you don't love doing what you do, then why are you doing it? Because the odds of any of us making a living at this are astronomical. There were 23 kids in my undergrad. There were 23 kids in my graduate program. First day of school in my graduate program. Room just like this, chairs just like this, everybody's around the room. The headmaster comes in, he says, welcome to the drama studio of London at Berkeley. We're gonna teach you about show business. What you've been doing up to now is plays. You've been having fun, you've been frolicking and, and acting and making love and that, but now we're gonna teach you about the business. He goes, I want you to look around the room. Of the 23 of you in here, only one or two of you are going to make a living at this. The rest of you are going to be doing community theater for the rest of your lives. Wow. Fuck. Really? Whew. Start looking around the room, you know? Community theater, community theater, community theater, community theater, community theater. 
That's uh, ego and arrogance, by the way. <laughs> uh, the I narrowed my odds down about one in ten. I said, okay, that's that's manageable. Now I have to tell you, I wasn't the best actor in my undergrad program. As a matter of fact, I was probably one of the worst actors in my undergrad program because I had never acted before. I was 21 years old when I took my first acting class. Most of these kids, they'd been acting since they were this high. They had a lot of experience. <clears throat> Of the 23 kids in my graduate program, I wasn't the best actor. So, why did I make it and they didn't? I don't know. I can't tell you why. But one night, I'm at my girlfriend's house, and everybody went to sleep, and I couldn't sleep, and it was at the infancy of HBO, and I'm watching Shirley MacLaine performing live from the Lido in Paris. And after and I'm like I'm 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 amazed. And after she's done, she gets out and she talks to the audience and she looks into the camera and she said, if anyone out there is interested in being an entertainer, I'm gonna tell you what it takes to make it. Oh, right. I'm like, yes, tell me, tell me. <laughs> and she says, it's gonna take the four D's. I'm like, okay, okay, what are they? What are they? And she says it's gonna take desire. It's gonna take drive. It's going to take dedication, and it's going to take devotion. I was like, okay, okay, shit, I only got two Ds. What am I going to do? Where am I going to get the other two Ds? I don't have them. They're not, they're not in me. And um, I had to learn. I had to learn to be dedicated. And I had desire and drive, you know, but I really wasn't dedicated and devoted, you know. It was early on. I was still in my 20s. I was more interested in getting high and getting laid, you know what I mean? Um... But that's not going to, um, well, it helps your craft a little bit. <laughs> because you need to have experience in life. How can I play someone who does a certain thing if I've never done it? Now, I've never murdered anyone, but I have to play a murderer. So what is the best way to do that? For example, I had this monologue from this play called Schubert's Last Serenade, and I'm talking in front of the judge, and I'm talking about my character, me, has clubbed this woman to death, and now I'm in jail. So I'm doing the monologue in this class, and this, uh, the instructor says, did you club the girl? No. Well, club her. Uh, I said, what? He goes, pick up a club and club her. I pick up my club. And I club her. And I have the experience. I didn't really club her, but I picked up a club. And I imagined myself, and I clubbed this person. And my body had that experience. It's not the real experience, but it's very close. Um, so experience is important. So experience life. Go out there, get drunk, get laid, you know, do whatever. Do it all, you know, so you have something to draw on. Um, Shakespeare and love. Anybody see it? Yeah. That's it. That's it. You know? This is what they did. It was a troupe of actors who just had no money and they begged off the rich to help them put on plays. Moulin Rouge. You know? It's this troupe. And they, and, they, and they beg off the rich in order to put on their plays and they eat whatever and they drink and they fuck and they love and they just exist. You know? That's the poet's life. That's the poet's life. So if you're willing to live that life, you know, great. Because that may be it. You know, rooming with people, hanging out, barely scraping by, food, shelter, and clothing, doing what you love to do. Um, took a class very early on, a workshop, and they gave me this sheet in this workshop, and they said, goals of participants. They told me to put my name on it. This is, I just come to town. Uh, I was 26 years old, and it said name, and then it said profession. And I put actor, writer, comedian, director, producer, audio rents driver. That was my job. But it asked me my profession. And I put how I made a living last. 
Okay? What works about your work? It's honest, it's me, it's likable, accessible, it's funny, it's intense, internal intensity. What doesn't work about your work? Sometimes some of the material doesn't click for me. I can't make the connection. My goal for the workshop, to land my first starring feature film role and get my SAG card, to become more in touch with who David is, to make my acting real at all times. And then it asked me my wildest career goal, to get to a point in the entertainment industry where I am respected as one of the best actors of my time to be a feature film movie star. Don't shortchange yourself. I asked an acting teacher once, I said, you got working actors and non-working actors in your class? He said, yeah. I said, what's the difference? He said, confidence. That simple. You gotta believe in yourself. You gotta believe that you have the gift. And you'll know if you have it or you don't. People will tell you. Angels will show up in your life. People will show up in your life. You know, when you least expect it. When you're down and you're out and you don't want to do it anymore because it's too fucking hard. And you haven't worked for nine months. You haven't worked for a year and a half. And you're thinking, what's the point of this? And I'm done, I'm tired. I can't go on another audition and get rejected one more time. And then you walk out of the dry cleaners and this lady will come, like come out of nowhere, seemingly come out of nowhere and say, oh my God, I saw you the other day on TV. You were fucking fantastic. And you go, okay, I get it. Stick it out. Because it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. Buddy of mine, not a buddy of mine, a, um, someone from my hometown who is of my parents' generation dated one of my aunts. I meet him out here when I first come to town 25 years ago. And he's an actor. I said, how long have you been out here? He said, 25 years. I said, how's it going? He goes, yeah, you know, I play my piano at like one of those um, restaurants where they play piano and the waiters sing. You know, and I do my little gigs and um, I get by and he does what we all do. He leads the poet's lifestyle. I run into him 20 years, 15, 20 years later 68 years old. I said, how's it, go how's it going? He goes, I got my first series regular gig on a TV show. The Bonnie Hunt show, he played the piano. Because they saw him at this restaurant where they were going, Bonnie Hunt and everybody else. And they were looking for a guy who could play piano and blah, 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 and be funny and be, be who he is. And he got his first, he finally went from making Fifteen thousand, twenty-five thousand dollars a year. Let's see, three thirty-five, forty thousand dollars a year to making, you know, ten, twenty thousand dollars a week. Sixty-eight years old. How did that happen? He never gave up. He never gave up. That's how it happened. He was willing to live the poet's life. Sam Jackson doing the poet's lifestyle, 40 years old. 40 years old, he gets one or two scenes in a Spike Lee movie, um, Jungle Fever, where he plays a crack addict and he's stealing his mom's TV. Film goes to con. They create an award for Best Supporting Actor. The Con Film Festival, historic, been around forever, did not have an award for Best Supporting Actor. They created one so they could give it to Sam Jackson at 40 years old. And look where he is today. How did that happen? He never gave up. He kept doing his work. Because that's what it's about. It's about the work. David Milch, one of the greatest television writers of our time, Deadwood, uh, NYPD helped create NYPD Blue. Gives a seminar on writing at the Writers Guild every once in a while, and he says, 
If you're if you're not here because you love to write, then I suggest you get up and leave now. Because if you don't love to write, then there's no reason to write. Because the odds of you making it as a writer, and the odds, odds of you getting on a show and being a showrunner, if that's your goal, run as fast as you can now. But if you're writing because you love to write, then I'm glad you're here. So if you're here because you love to act, I'm glad you're here. You're in the right place. Um, so I come to town. I got kicked out of the drama studio, by the way. I graduated from Northeastern University with a degree in speech communications and um, a minor in theater. I didn't get a dual degree because I didn't take theater history. Um, I just wasn't up for it. All that memorization. I didn't really care. I do now. I wish I had. Maybe I'll go back and get it. And then I went to the uh, professional actors training program called the Drama Studio of London at Berkeley. They had two schools, one in London, one in Berkeley. And I got kicked out of that school. Um, and so I moved to L.A. And I need some tools. I need to let people know that I am here. They can't hire David Marciano unless they know that David Marciano is here. I can't buy Coca-Cola unless I know you're selling Coca-Cola. How do I know to buy Coca-Cola? Because it's on the TV all the time. It's on billboards. They're marketing themselves. So how do I let everybody know that David Marciano's in town? Showcases. If you do stand-up comedy or you, you're, you're a uh, uh, solo performer, create a show, get a space, do it. Make little videos. Right now we have the Internet. It's fantastic. You can make videos yourself and put them up on the Internet. Um, you got to get a headshot and a resume. Uh, and I suggest you get postcards. Postcards are great because they're cheaper. And it's a great way to market yourself. So I come to town. And you got to target. Okay, I believe in targeting certain groups of people and inundating that group for a while and then picking, pick 10 agents, pick 10 casting directors and bombard them. After about three to six months of that, pick 10 more, bombard them. So what I did was, and you pick, casting directors are casting shows that you think you could be on. For example, I'm from Newark, New Jersey. I grew up with Tommy Motorola, Johnny Dempson, the Weasel. Um, well, let, me go, let me go one back one step. So this guy comes in from Hollywood to talk to everybody, and he says, okay, I know you all want to be Lawrence Olivier and Meryl Streep, he said, but the truth is, I'm in television, and television is very specific, and in Hollywood, the apple doesn't fall that far from the tree. So what I would suggest you do, yeah, get this foundation, learn as much as you can, he said, but I want you to find your type, I want you to perfect it, and then I want you to sell it, which means market it. Find your type, perfect it, and then sell it. Okay, got it. So now I'm, I'm like, what's my type? Do you know my type? I have no idea what my type is. you know what my type is? I'm asking everybody in the green room, what's my type? I'm asking my teacher, what's my type? And everybody goes, street scum. <laughs> I said, what do you mean, street scum? They go, yeah, you're a rat. You're like a, you look like a rat, like a weasel. You're a weasel. I said, I'm a weasel. Yeah, okay, weasel. All right, street rat. Yeah, 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 scum. Yeah, yeah, like, 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 like what? They go, like, drug addicts and uh, used car salesmen and, and uh, gangsters, like little street, you know, hoodlums. And so I said, okay, okay, okay. So I decide, okay, if that's my type, if that's what you see when I walk into the room, and that's what they saw, right? They knew me. That's what they got. That's what I led with. Because I grew up in Newark, New Jersey, and I hung out with these wannabe wise guys, and I had this sort of flair that I just picked up from growing up in this neighborhood. So I decided to say, okay, I'm going to go to Hollywood. I'm going to become the best street scum this town ever, ever saw. So I took a picture 
at my grandmother's 80th birthday party with me in a suit, my hair slicked back, rings on my thing, in front of a bar going, hey. Right? So that was one of my shots that went out to, to casting people. Right? Um, I worked on every scene from the Pope of Greenwich Village. I played both parts, the Eric Roberts part and the, and the uh, Mickey Rourke part. I worked on parts from The Godfather. I worked on, you know, used cars. I, I did every type of street scum, weaselly kind of dirt bag, and I, and, I, and I really perfected it. And it turns out that one of the first roles that I ever got was Thug Number 2 on a soap opera, Bold and the Beautiful is an under five. And then my second role was uh, playing this gangster's nephew who comes over from Italy, kills uh, this guy on the boat, takes over his identity, infiltrates his uncle Sonny's business, starts killing all of his associates, uh, s sleeps with the, the other guy's girlfriend and just, just shooting and killing and, you know, raping. It was crazy. It was crazy. Um, but it was great. Um, so I implore you, for now, get your foot in the door. We'll become Robert De Niro and Meryl Streep later. But right now, get your foot in the door. Become the best possible you you can be. And then start to branch out. Um, I'm going to leave these with Jake. So, oh, so the marketing. So, you, so what I did was I sent a headshot and resume to 10 casting directors and 10 agents. And then I would send a postcard every other week, sometimes every week. So they would get my headshot and resume. And then they would get, these are, these are a little um, more advanced. But when I, I didn't have all these credits, but I still had a postcard with my picture on it and everything. I'm gonna pass these around. Um, just look at them and pass them around. Um, and I was in an acting class, getting an acting class. If you wanna be an orange, you hang out with the oranges. If you wanna be an apple, you hang out with the apples. If you wanna be a pineapple, you hang out with the pineapples. If you wanna be an actor, you hang out with actors. Um, I got myself in an acting class and um, so what happened was I'm sending out my headshots and resumes and I'm trying to get an agent. And the best way to get into is with a commercial agent. Commercial agents are willing to take on new people with, uh, that are non-SAG, that it has a good look, that they think they can market and sell. And that's how I started out. Um, but what I did on my own is that you have to do something every day for your craft as an artist and every day for your craft as a business because it's show business. It's show business. So um, eight months later, my phone rings after hitting these 10 casting directors and these 10 agents. And it's a casting director. And he says, I'd like to speak to David Marciano. I said, this is him. He goes, I am looking at 14 postcards of your face on my desk. <laughs> and anyone who is that persistent deserves a meeting. I'll see you in my office on Monday at 10 a.m. Have a good weekend. And I got my first appointment 14 postcards later. And then right after that, and that was just a general meeting and not a big casting director, but right after that, I got a meeting for a Ed Weinberger created Taxi, TV show Taxi. He also created a TV show called Dear John. Dear John was cast by a man by the name of Randy Stone, who is no longer with us. I had sent my postcard to Randy Stone for 14 straight months. He was casting the role of Kirk, which was played by Jerry Burns. And I got, my, I got an appointment without an agent, without a manager. And I got to read for a series regular on a brand new pilot for NBC created by Ed Weinberger, the creator of Taxi, on my own, based on my persistence and my picture. I didn't get the job, but I got the opportunity. And I created a relationship, because that's what we're doing. Yes, I want the job when I go in there, but that's not what's important. What's important is creating that relationship. What's important is making that casting director go, Wow, okay, this guy's good, this, this girl's good, um, I'm going to look out for her, I'm going to keep her on my list, 
you know, because that's what we're doing. We're creating relationships. The win in any audition is leaving that audition and having created a fan. That's the win. The job is the job. Somebody's going to get it. The odds are so astronomical. I'm not worried about getting the job. I'm worried about, I'm not worried about anything, but I, my, what, I, what my focus is, my focus is establishing, creating a fan. That's my focus. Creating a fan who's going to call me in again and again and again. Because it's going to take, it took Ehrlich, Dawson, Kritzer eight years of calling me in before I booked a job with them. Maybe more. 12 years. They called me in for one TV show eight times in one season back in the 80s. I never got a job. But they were my fans. And they called me in for almost 12 years. I auditioned for this casting company for 12 fucking years. I can't even tell you how many auditions. 40, 50? And I finally booked a job with them. In 2000 and I don't know what it was. Several years ago. That's it. It's not a sprint. It's a marathon. My agent calls me up. Oh, they want to see you for such and such again. I'm like, fuck them. <laughs> fuck them. I bleed my heart and soul out for them for eight times in the last four months. <laughs> Do you really think that I'm going to show them something that they haven't seen before? Fuck them, man. Tell them it's a fucking offer or I ain't going. That ain't going to work. That ain't work. If they wanted to make me an offer, they would have made me an offer. You know, there's no muscles to flex in our position. It's the talent. It's the work that speaks for ourselves. You know, I always talk about basketball players. You know, let your game talk. Don't shoot your mouth off. Let your game do the talking. Yeah, let your game do the talking. Okay. Um, what time is it? 2.15. Oh, okay. I got to open it up for questions. Talk about um, um, how you got on the shield or working in your recent years or, or not? I don't think that's uh, really so relevant at this stage of the game. I think what I talked about is what was relevant at this stage of the game for everybody. Um, so I'll open it up for questions. Yes, sir. With your with your 40 times going in for, for UDK, um, it, I mean, at any point did it like, did it occur to you, like, are these guys fucking with me? Like, are they just holding the carrot out? Like, like what went through your mind there? Like, were you just always gracious to get the call or, or what? I was frustrated at times, but, um, you know, when I told him, when I told Eric, I said, Eric, you're not going to believe it. this is the first time you've hired me. And like, da -da -da. he goes, well, why did we keep calling you in? He, he didn't even know. He assumed they had, that I had been hired before. Yeah. But, um... No, because as I got older, see, when I, was, when I was starting out, I would get 16 to 17 pilot auditions, okay, a year. Because 66% of all roles for white males go to white males under 30. And you can play that till you're about 35. Once you get over 35 and you get into the 40s and the 50s, now there's only 33% of the roles. So I went from getting 16 and 17 pilot auditions for the first 10 years of my career to 13, to, to 6, to 3, to 1 or 2. Now, I've been on three different series as a series regular. I've been a series regular for Stephen Bochco, Emmy Award winning writer, producer. I've been a series regular for Paul Haggis, an Academy Award winner and Emmy, Emmy winner. I've been a series regular on The Shield, which was a historic series, and they don't care. The business has changed. It's all about marketing. It's all about marketing now, you know. A guy or a girl who just wins Survivor has a better chance of getting his or her own series than I do. Don't knock the reality shows. Get on one. Have fun, especially if it's something you can do. I'm a great chef, you know? I'll cook Rachel Ray under the fucking table anytime. I'll go head to head with her anytime. 
you'll be eating my food before you'll be eating hers. I guarantee it. But see, that's the kind of attitude you need to have. You know what I mean? You got to go in there and say, you know, yeah. They love that. Someone who walks in the room and owns it. You know? You know? Yeah, you get down, but you just never give up. Billy Crystal said you hang around the kitchen long enough, they got to give you something to eat. Um, you mentioned that you're now also writing and directing. Um, are you typically attaching yourself as an actor to those projects? Or? In a very small capacity, because okay. it's all about marketing. One and two on the call sheet are superstars. It's just the way it is, because they can't sell the show any other way. And it's all about making money for them. On that side of the camera, it's commerce. On our side, it's art. To the commerce people, you just can't help it. I mean, look at, um, there's this one show, I mean, the Brothers and Sisters, one through seven are movies, I mean, are stars, you know? When I started out in the business, I I've been number two on the call sheet three times. All right? I can't be number two on the call sheet anymore. You know, back in the 80s and 90s, I could. Not now, you know? On The Shield, I was number nine. On this new show that I got, I think I'm like seven or nine. That's the best I'm going to do. Even with all my talent and all my credentials. Because they can get whoever the fuck they want. They got Claire Danes, Mandy Patankin, Damian Lewis from Band of Brothers as the top three stars of the show. I can't compete with that. I mean, do you guys know who I am? No. But I've made over three million dollars as an actor. You don't know who I am. I've worked for luminaries, the biggest people in show business. Don't matter. You don't know who I am. You're not, I'm not the reason why you're going to turn on the television. You know? And that's who they want in those top, you know, three to five, one, one through five. They want people who are going to help them get that television turned on so they can sell their, their, uh, their grapes and their Tide and whatever the else they sell on TV these days, vacuum cleaners. What do you think is the best uh, sort of method once you get, let's say, a, a pilot, so you book a pilot, and it's a small role, it's maybe a co-star, but it is the pilot episode, so it could be written in later. What is the best method after you've shot to stay in touch with the producers and the casting people? Now, I mean, casting makes sense. You can always send a letter and thank you for casting me. Producers, let's say, like, uh, you know, Jason Weiner, who, you know, who directed the pilot of Modern Family, who's now now a director, directed uh, Arthur, and and then you've got Steve, who's the executive producer of that show. And how do you keep in contact hard. with people? I mean, what do you, it's hard. What's the way that's not obnoxious and, like, some weird active guy? Finding that one thing that you connect with. Like, a friend of mine was collected baseball memorabilia, and it just so happened that this producer loved baseball memorabilia, and they had a connection, and they were able to separate from the business and be personal or something. Yeah, it's hard. You so know, you happen to have a connection on set. It happens to start. If it happens, it happens, right. You know, you can't force it. You can't force it. Um, you know, when I got onto my, I didn't take advantage. My first two series, I didn't take advantage of fostering my, the first 10 years of my career, I didn't foster my relationships. It was a big mistake. Because no one taught me that. You see, you go to acting school, they don't teach you that. They teach you about acting and about, you know, they don't teach you about the business of show business. Um, and even even at the you know I, I was I didn't have the acumen for it. So my first ten years, you know, all I wanted to be was Robert De Niro anyway. You know what I mean I didn't give a fuck whether you liked me or not. You know because it was just about me winning my Emmy and my Oscar and you know and fucking acting and uh, you know what I mean. Was, uh, I'm a fucking I'm the talent. Yeah, what was that movie with that uh, Tom Hanks did with the band? The plate. Oh, uh the play tones it was the company yeah. but it was the band and remember he said no you're the star and that guy that dick that's the that's the talent and we don't give a shit about him because he's got a bad fucking attitude but you were going to make millions of dollars with because he was the nice guy he was the guy who did whatever they said yeah. yeah but the guy that butts up against them and the guy that's just worried about his solo they don't, they don't time for that guy no time for that guy um so it's hard, you know. I, in, in my third series, I decided, you know what, I'm going to foster these relationships. And I would ask them about them. 
hey, what's going on? How are you doing today? Because I was there every week. You have to remember, with a co-star and a pilot, you're there for one day. It's really hard. But I was there every week for two or three days. So whenever a guest director came on or the writer producers, I would just talk about, hey, man, how'd you get started? You know, what are you doing in your spare time? You know? Oh, it's great. Oh, really? No, I love that. Yeah, oh, yeah, I'm a golfer. Yeah, maybe we should golf sometime. You know, just, you know, and... And that's an art in itself. Oh, you, yeah. You know, that line of being interested but not needy. Yeah, it's a real interesting... <laughs> How do you make it authentic without, you know, thinking that you're just... You're a damn good actor for You do. You really do. Or you got to, you know, you, you got to just mean it. Yeah. And if it's not there, it's not there and fuck it. Because you're going to polarize. You I mean, you're going to make... It's like It's like in life. How many people do I meet that I connect with? You know? Yeah, my One. sister was on Broadway a bunch of times, like decent roles with Black Danner, uh, in uh, uh, Follies, and a few different shows, Steel Piers and all that stuff. She was not the business side. She's super talented, super sweet, but super shy when it came to like fostering all those relationships. And it's hard. She never was able to roll into anything else. She had all these huge credits. And that was like, man, man. Right, like writers, especially for writers. I mean, like our show got picked up. Now the showrunner is going to hire writers. Who's he going to hire? He's going to, he was on 24, so he's going to hire one or two writers from 24 that he had a rapport with. And he's going to hire some of his friends who he's writers with who from other shows that he's never worked with before. Because that's how it goes. Nepotism is it's just the way it goes. So, um, you know, be amenable, be nice. Um, don't be a pest. Be patient, but be persistent. Um, be authentic. And um, send them something. Send them a little gift. People remember, like I have a bowl that a guy gave us from our wedding. Every time I use that bowl, what do I think of? I think of him. Oh, let me call Mark up. I made a salad in the bowl. This is 20, 19 years ago I got married. But I still have the bowl that Mark gave me. So you send him a little something. You know, I have, I, I, uh, when I was on my first show, and I, I bought these little trinkets, these um, Couturo, the De Simone was this artist, and I would buy these little candle holders, and I would give them to the directors, and maybe when he sees that candle holder, he goes, oh, Dave Marston, but that's not going to be, his experience is going to go, fuck that jerk off, you know, because <laughs> I was really, t my first 10 years, like I said, I, um, I, I fought for what I believed in creatively, as opposed to, what can I bring to the show? You see, because they just spent three months figuring out the show in a writer's room, 18 hours a day. It takes a month to write each episode. The last thing they want on the set, the actor's like, who fucking wrote this shit? I'm not going to fucking say that. They just spent 18 hours a day, three months in a writer's room, breaking stories for each character, a month and like seven drafts of each episode. And some fucking actor is going to say he doesn't want to say that? That's a let, they, they're not interested. They're not going to hire that. Why did Jennifer Beals go from lie to me? A Sean Ryan, that Sean Ryan show that he ran for a year to Chicago Code. Why do you think she went from that show to that other show with Sean Ryan? Because she complained about Sean Ryan's writing all the time? That he did, she didn't like the lines that she was having to say? No. The reason why she got to go on to that next show, because she just kept her mouth shut. She did her job every day. She made their job easier. Why is Dennis Franz a multi-gazillionaire? And I'm not, because Dennis Franz did ever what Stephen Bochco said to do. Dennis Franz went from uh, Hill Street Blues to Beverly Hills Bunts, which was his own pilot, to NYPD Blue. Why? Because Dennis showed up on time. He never squawked. He said his lines. He went home. He said thank you. Now, Dennis has retired a gazillionaire fucking sitting somewhere and he, you haven't seen him since MIPD Blue, have you? He's done. He's done. I could have been a gazillionaire. My, my agent told me, why are you fighting with these people? I said, but you don't understand. This doesn't make sense. I'm a fucking poet. I gotta win my Emmy and I know if I can just, just manipulate this a little bit, I can fucking get my Emmy. 
No time for that shit. Uh, how long have you been with your current agent? I don't have an agent right now. Oh, yeah. I just left my agent that I was with for uh, 10 years. That, that was Buckwall? That was Buckwall, that's right. I decided to part ways with them. Um, very sleepy. Buckwald's very sleepy. They don't have to work hard. They have Howard Stern. So that's $50 million on his last $500 million deal, and he just renegotiated his contract. So Buckwald doesn't have to. I don't make money for Don Buckwald, so they don't have to push me. They're sleepy, you know. I was only getting production. I was getting very little production, and... Um, Agents were getting a little short with me. I got the sense on the phone that they were more interested in the next phone call than the one that they were on. Right. Um, but no one was looking for me. And I live by the philosophy is, I want the agent who wants me. And that's how I got Buckwald. I was with a different agency, and an agent from Buckwald came up to me and said, I want to work with you. And I said, I'll take a meeting with you. Because when, when they come to you, they want to work with you, you know they're going to work for you. But if I got to run you down to get a meeting with you to get you to represent me, and I finally convince you to represent me, and plus, they're not going to sleep at night thinking about David Marciano. They got other people, you know, that they're going to, you know, they got, you know, they got bigger stars they got to worry about than Dave Marciano. But, you know, I was there. Um, I had already established my career, but um, I was hoping for someone else to come around. And, um, you know, but... Nobody wants a character actor over 50. Like I said, I went from 17 pilot auditions to one or two. You know how many pilot auditions you have to get to get one? You've got to get 17 fucking pilot auditions to test for one or two of them and to possibly get one. You know, the odds are just so crazy. Um, so one day I'm an international, and this is just trusting, okay? I'm an international silks and woolens on Beverly near Kings Road. I'm there with my daughter. And we're buying some stuff for her, and all of a sudden, there's these two older ladies behind us, and, oh, hi, they see my daughter, what are you buying? And we start talking, and she's like, oh, she's so cute, and she goes, I go, hey, yeah, yeah, and she goes, she goes, I love you. <laughs> I said, oh, thank you. She goes, ah, you're so good on the shield. I said, oh, thanks, yeah, it was a great show. Oh, my husband and I, we, we just never miss it. I said, well, thank you, it's really sweet of you. I said, uh, yeah, it was a great show, historic, blah, blah, blah. She goes, yeah. She goes, you're so talented. She goes, you know that show you did with Paul Haggis, you know, where you played the Chicago cop against the Canadian Mountie, you do south? You shot that in Toronto, right? I'm like, yeah. She goes, wow, you're funny. You're so fucking funny. Thank you, thank you. She goes, and I've just loved you ever since that first series. I said, who are you? <laughs> who the fuck are you? Are you in the business? She goes, yes, I am. I'm a manager. I said, may I have your card? She goes, my pleasure. I knew right there my agents were fired uh, she was your manager. and she was my manager and I didn't care because this woman knew more about my career than the six agents at Buckwald. They were more, she was more passionate about my work than those six agents at Buckwald. Right. And I know that all you really need is one person who's fucking passionate about you, who's willing to get on the phone every fucking day and fucking sell you and you'll be fine. So um, has, I'm just has, running with a manager. Has she done well by you? I'm not getting any more appointments than I did when I was at Buckwall, uh. which brings up another point. Okay, so my first agent I stayed with for like 10 to 15 years. Uh, then I went to William Morris for a little bit. I was with Talent Works, which is Harry Gold. I was with Talent Works from the beginning, and then I tried William Morris. Um, uh, and then Buckwald, and there was two little small stops in between. Um, I followed. Steve Glick at Steve Glick. Yeah, no, I, I didn't deal with him. I dealed with I dealt with um, Jeff Witches, who is now at APA. Um, and what I found is the industry views me the way the industry views me. It's not the agent. The agent can sell, 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 but if the industry's not interested in seeing you, they're not going to see you. So it doesn't, in some instances, especially after you've been in the business as long as I have, 25 years, I'm a character. They know they. I've, you know, I have a body of work that's just, they go yes or no, you know what I mean? It's hard to really persuade them. Um, so at some point, it doesn't matter who you're with because you cannot change the industry's perception of you until you do a role that changes their perception of you. You say Eli Wallach is different than you are then? I mean, he does a lot of character work. 
Is he different? Well, sort of, you know, tell you what's he a little di- well, what's different about you? Well, he's, I know he's, a lot older. he's a lot older than I am, so he's in a whole different category. A longer, a more grand career, maybe. What's the, uh, he, when he started out, right, and I don't know his career too well, but he started out in feature films, and he's had some pretty big roles, and he might have been nominated for some awards. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so Eli Wallach is a star at one time who's now character actor. So they have a similar energy to you, that you have and something I think is marketable. Alan, uh, Alan Arkin. Mm-hmm. For sure. I'm, I'm looking forward to his death, to be honest with you. <laughs> Just step in. If he dies, I'm all set. <laughs> That's terrible, but you know, the way it fucking goes. Um, I, I, I don't know if you, you probably don't know anything about him trying to get a, a general idea because these casting director workshops that are around town, I've tried them. I just can't get, they're really weird. I was wondering if you knew anything, if it, if you think they work, if, should I force myself to go to these fucking things? You should, absolutely, because, again, uh, how, what's your name? John. John what? John Henry. John Henry. How do I know to buy John Henry? I don't know that John Henry's in town. Right. Yeah, yeah. So I go to the casting workshop and I say, hi, uh, John Henry. Yeah, I'm really, you know, John Henry. Yeah, I'm really, uh, uh, John Henry. Right, nice to meet you. John Henry. Nice to meet you, John Henry. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. John Henry. Don't forget, my name's John Henry. Um, you know. Yeah. And then you send them, you immediately, the next day, send your postcard. And that's the thing. I'm and then you send it again. The and then you send it again, and then you send it again, and then you send it again, and you send one, you find out who the assistant is, you send one to the assistant, and you send one to the casting director. Now, I don't know if she's going to give the one to the cast director because her job is to go through all this mail anyway and fucking sift through it but if one's addressed to her or him the assistant and one's addressed to the casting director i hope you'll do your fucking law abiding job which is you're not legally allowed to open anybody else's mail and give it to the proper person it is addressed to is that going to happen i don't know what's the point of sending all those postcards in the head subconscious it's subconscious Right? Uh, Dave Marciano, again, Dave Marciano, fuck Dave Marciano, fuck Dave Marciano, Dave Marciano.